thanks for the organizers for the invitation. And yeah, so as Nicola told, I'm going to talk about easing model and random triangulations with a boundary, starting from the combinatorics and progressing towards the geometry. And uh, this is mostly based on joint work with Ling Xia Chen, who is now in ETA Zurich. And uh, there are the three articles uh, containing the contents of this talk, more or less. All right. So, well, I'm going to review a bit background first. So those who know and also who don't know, Ising model is sort of like a canonical model of ferromagnetism in statistical mechanics. And it's usually defined on a fixed or regular graph, also called lattice. And it's introduced by Lenz in 1920 and solved by his PhD student Ising in one dimensions. And well, it's been generalized since then to higher dimensions, uh, in particular in two dimensions where most of the interesting rigorous results have been proven. And some remarkable properties in the 2D is the exact solution uh, by Onsager in 1944, which is, means that he managed to calculate the partition function or free energy. And then he was able to detect a phase transition of the model, which actually didn't happen in one dimension. And then um, later on in the 80s, there are uh, those guys, Belavin, Polyakov, and Chemologico, who study uh, conformal feed theory. And uh, based on their work, there's a series of mathematicians studying correlations of the Ising model, uh, which continue until today and still in the future, I guess. And then uh, the third thing I want to highlight is a conformally invariant scaling, scaling limit of in interfaces, uh, which some sort of landmark result is the work uh, of uh, fermionic observable by Stas Smirnov in 2010. And uh, starting from that, there have been various proofs of the convergence of the easing interface towards SLE3. All right, so this is all in the regular lattice case. So then uh, how about if we are interested in a random lattice? So that's called dynamical lattice in physics. And it dates back to the work of Kazakov and Bulatov and Kazakov in the 80s, late 80s. And uh, original physics motivations were to study the level quantum gravity coupled with some matter fields. And level quantum gravity was introduced by Polyakov in 1981. And so this is sort of like a discrete model of level quantum gravity where we have some sort of matter interaction. And then another motivation which was around the late 80s also was uh, to study certain critical exponents because at uh, that time, Kisnik, Polyakov, and Samolodzikov um, published a famous paper about so-called KBZ relation, which led uh, us to relate uh, certain quantum critical exponents to Euclidean critical exponents. And in particular, many critical exponents are easier to study in the quantum side. So that's another motivation to consider easing model on random lattices. So what does it mean for us who are interested in planar maps? So first of all, those results already told that to some extent or gave at least some hints that the critical behavior of the model is different than in a pure gravity universality class. So they should fall in different universality class. And in our language, we we are interested to study random planar maps coupled with an easing model, which is like, well, this is an annealed model so that we sample the easing model together with the random planar map. And we want to find some critical behavior which differs from the universal class of the Brownian map. And we want to also see how the geometry changes. All right, so that's the plan. Now I'm going to introduce the model. So. In this talk, I only consider uh, triangulations with a boundary. So what is a triangulation? It's a rooted planar map of an 
m gone, m is not a parameter of the polygon, the external phase, and uh, meaning all the internal phases are triangles and external phase we assume that it's simple so it doesn't have any pinch points and uh, well loops and multiple edges are allowed because I don't prohibit them. All right, so then we add to each internal phase or alternatively, alternatively each vertex a spin which is either plus or minus or well you can think about two different colors too. And then we impose a Dobrosin boundary condition on the spins outside the boundary. So we have two different cases on the right hand side uh, we put the spins on the faces, so in that case we need to put um, two boundary segments uh, like we, we need to uh, put uh, boundary value outside uh, this edge. So we can imagine that we have two marked vertices, row and row dagger, and then there's some edge joining them. So it's parts like partitions the exterior face and the two spins minus and plus region respectively. Or we can put the spins on the vertices in which case uh, the boundary condition is just uh, consists of uh, two segments of um, spins on the boundary. So, so that's the model. And uh, well, we might also have zero minus spins or zero plus spins. In that case we say that the boundary is monochromatic. All right, so this is the combinatorial and there's not, no randomness involved yet. So then uh, I count the volume of the triangulation either by the number of internal phases, uh, in particular when the spins are on the faces, or number of edges, well, in, when the spins are on the vertices. Well, other choices are possible, but these are just by convenience, like make the combinatorics a bit simpler. And in the latter case, if we count the number of edges, we find a direct relation to the uh, model studied by Albong, Menard, and Schaeffer, well, where they consider uh, using triangulations with spins and vertices and on the full, full plane. All right, so then we denote spin configuration by sigma, and uh, we call an edge monochromatic if it separates two faces or vertices with the same spin and then denote by uh, ET sigma the set of monochromatic edges in a fixed triangulation T with an uh, easing spin configuration. And uh, here in this picture on the left it's uh, just a uh, triangulation of a polygon without an easing configuration and where the boundary needs to be simple and then we root it at some corner row and uh, it has exactly 19 faces in this example. On the right, uh, we have the same triangulation decorated with an easy model on the faces. And uh, you can count that uh, in this case, there are exactly 18 monochromatic edges. So you need to also note the boundary condition here. All right. So then we encode uh, we fixed the boundary length p plus q and uh, we assign it with p plus spins and q minus spins as a boundary condition. So these are the bursting boundary condition. And we encode those triangulations by a partition function where we sum our all um, triangulations of the p plus q gone with the bursting boundary condition of that type and an easing configuration. And here, what we sum is the Boltzmann weight, more or less, of this model. So nu is now a coupling constant uh, which enumerates uh, by the monochromatic, uh, number of monochromatic edges, and that nu is more or less exponential of uh, easing inverse temperature. And then T is now a coupling constant for the volume. And we furthermore encode those partition functions by generating function 
uh, which have two catalytic, catalytic variables, you know, we, so we sum over all the positive boundary lengths. And uh, this turning function is the key object. In order to uh, study the asymptotics of this partition function for when p and q are large, so that we could hope for some sort of half plane infinite triangulation. All right, so here's our first result. So we fixed any positive temperature which corresponds to new greater than one, and this corresponds to ferromagnetic easing model in any fixed temperature. And uh, we show that this turning function for T and U, any three parameters, it's an algebraic function, and it has an explicit rational parameterization, so that um, we parameterize those variables U and V by uh, some rational functions, uh, some rational function U hat when T is fixed, and then T also is parameterized by some uh, parameter S. And um, this T hat, U hat, and Z hat, all of them have explicit rational expression. So this more or less, uh, when physicists mention that uh, the model is ex exactly solvable, this could be some sort of indication to this direction. So we can compute the partition function by using a rational parameterization. All right. And how do we prove this? Well, we start first by decomposing. We fix the boundary length P plus 1 uh, plus Q. So we assume that there's at least one plus H on the boundary. And then we reveal one triangle adjacent to this boundary edge, which denote by E here. So this decomposition is exactly the first step in the peeling process. And uh, in this case, uh, it's just a combinatorial decomposition, which gives us recursion relation as follows. So this is exactly the picture written by equation of the partition function. All right. And in this case, when we, we are spins on phases, as in this case, um, we have two edges to choose. We have either a, a plus edge or the minus edge if, if there is any minus edge. So we can write exactly the same for a minus edge. But we don't really need to do it because when we sum over all the boundaries, uh, we get an... Oh, we get an equ equation for the turning function, big C, U, V, and uh, that, that fun turning function is symmetric with respect to U and V, so we can exchange U and V. So we get actually a system of linear equations, which we can represent in a compact form, uh, in a mat matrix form. And uh, that one, um, turns out to be a sort of like a closed system of equations. So there are discrete differential equations where now um, they involve the partition function of the monochromatic boundary or generating function of the monochromatic boundary case. And then uh, the case where there's one minus spin. And um, as you see here, we have just exchanged the role of U and V by symmetry. But uh, this turning function stays the same, so we get two equations, and that's good. Yeah, and then we have discrete derivatives up to the second derivative, so it's like second order. Discrete differential equation. All right, and how do we attack this? We can start to extract coefficients uh, from that equation. So we get some further equations for the this z0 and z1 here. Well, I will skip here details, but in the end, we can eliminate z1. And we find a rational expression for our partition function guv, uh, which involves now the 
part, uh, generic function for the monochromatic boundary case. And uh, yeah, so this is something which is probably found in physics literature or also a work by Bernard Ennard. So this guy would, would be called like disk amplitude and uh, it basically gives enough information to solve the whole uh, bivariate generating function. All right, but now the problem is that uh, this one, at, uh, when, when we are done with our coefficient extraction, we have just eliminated one catalytic variable, but we still have uh, these partition functions G1 and Z3, which are now um, defined like this. So we have still some unknown partition functions there. But we are quite lucky because there was a work by Bernardi and Busquemelo uh, back then where they have actually parameterized these uh, generating functions uh, in the case where they consider spins on the vertices. But we can use Kramer's one duality rea relation to relate to find the parameterizations in our case when spins are on the phases. And uh, then, um, moreover, after we plug in the parameterizations here, this equation is actually of genus zero. So it's a genus zero algebraic equation. So it has a rational parameterization. And uh, we can use an algorithm in Maple which find a rational parameterization for um, any given temperature. Well, here I cheat a bit because if nu is arbitrary, Mabel doesn't find anything. We need to take some particular values of nu and then, uh, uh, well, interpolate so that we find a good guess of, uh, yeah. So can you recall what the ZK, uh, ZK0 was? Ah, so this is just the partition function where uh, there's only uh, k plus spins on the boundary. So it's a monochromatic boundary of a small length. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, but yeah. So we can find a by interpolating for different values of new. We can find a general expression of the rational parameterization, and we can a posteriori check that uh, it satisfies the functional equations. So it's indeed a rational parameterization for arbitrary new. All right, so that's the idea how to show the first result. Well, before we had two parameters, t and, t and nu, and uh, t was now the coupling constant for the number of phases. So we want to study the model on that critical coupling constant. So that's the most interesting one, and also um, there's a work by Bernardi and Busquet Mello where they actually find an equation of this uh, critical value of t. So here, like, um, they, they, they study the um, partition function where it has boundary length one and exactly one uh, boundary spin. And uh, the asymptotics of that partition function um, when uh, the volume tends to infinity um, depends on the temperature such that if we are outside the, a critical temperature, then we have the standard uh, pure gravity asymptotic behavior, which is also in the UIPT case. But if we are in a critical temperature, uh, then uh, the critical behavior is different. So there's a different uh, volume exponent, 1703, and this is perfectly predicted by physics literature. Moreover, using this relation and uh, the Kramer's one year duality, what I mentioned, uh, we find, well, an explicit, say, candidate for critical temperature. Well, it is the critical temperature because this should already tell it like it shows sort of like a phase transition, which is in line with the physics theory. 
So we find critical values of nu and t, which is, this is now uh, the sort of like a dilute point of the model. So we can write an explicit critical line for any new greater than one and find a unique critical point. And putting two other words, this uh, tau nu is just a radius of convergence of uh, the partition functions uh, of a small boundary or actually for any boundary. And this is also studied by Albank, Menach, and Schaeffer, you know, when the spins are on vertices. All right. So now in the SQL, we want to work on the critical line. And uh, this is our second, like, bigger result. So we fix the temperature and we study the asymptotics of our partition functions when the boundary size is large. So there are two ways we can do it. First, first is that we let, uh, we fix the, say, plus boundary length to be P, and then we study a large minus boundary length Q. And the asymptotic behavior is like this. So now U C nu is a radius of convergence uh, of the generating function where U was the um, catalytic variable. And then um, here uh, we have a parameter exponent alpha zero or alpha zero plus one where now this alpha zero depends on the temperature regime. So there are three regimes. One is temperatures between one and new critical and then there's the critical temperature and then there's uh, new greater than new C. And actually I was sloppy. It's not the temperature. It's a exponential of inverse temperature, so it means that this regime here is now high temperature and this is low temperature. Okay, so now alpha zero is the first parameter exponent we have and uh, we see that at a critical point it gets some value which is different than uh, in the pure gravity. So now in here 3 over 2 plus 1 is 5 over 2, it's the same parameter exponent as in undecorated or uniform triangulations. But in the critical temperature, we find something different. Well, but this first parameter exponent doesn't really distinguish the high and low temperature. But if we look at this, this coefficient, which depends now on P, which was the plus boundary length, we check the asymptotics of this and um, we find another parameter exponent. So it has the same um, critical value of nu, but um, different parameter exponent. And it's shown like here. So now one might wonder that, how about if we let P and Q tend to infinite simultaneously? Well, in that case, we find asymptotics where actually the parameter exponent is the sum of those two and uh, that's not a coincidence, but that's neither trivial. So it cannot be deduced directly from these asymptotics, but it needs more. And um, then here, um, what we should be interested in is this constant C, which now depends on uh, the ratio of Q and P. So we want Q and P uh, stay close to some diagonal. Well, we cannot explicitly require the stay as a, in the diagonal because of some technical reasons in the proof, but, um, but we can take those, say, arbitrarily close to each other, so. But this is actually a stronger result than staying on the diagonal. So this is just needed uh, later. So that's why we require this, that this ratio stay on the 
contact interval. All right, but here I didn't write down what is this C, Q, P. Well, what is C, say, C lambda? It has really explicit expressions, so it is um, 1 plus lambda to the power minus 5 over 2 if, if um, nu is between 1 and nu critical, so it's a high temperature case. And then it's lambda to the minus 5 over 2 if nu is greater than nu critical. Then the critical temperature is the most interesting, so in that case it will be 4 over 3 times the integral from 0 to infinity. And here we will have lambda plus x to minus 7 over 3 times 1 plus x minus 7 over 3 integrate over x. This 4 over 3 here is not a coincidence, but it's, I don't have time to explain where it comes from, but it's the same parameter exponent as in the critical using case. And, and this constant exact value we need when we study the scaling limit of the interface length, the model. All right, so how do we approach this problem? We want to understand the, the singularity structure of the bivariate turning function. And uh, it boils down to understand the singularity structure of the rational parameterization of two variables h and k. And now s, uh, since we are on the critical line, we have parameter s only. We don't have any dependence on t since t is fixed. It only depends on the temperature. So this involves a few things to check. First, uh, we need to identify the uc nu in the asymptotic formula. So, so now what happens is that um, our parameterization u hat h, um, well, it's a rational function. We can study the critical points by doing explicit computation. So it has a critical point, say, H, C, which depends on S. And this is like the critical point of the minimal modulus you can find. And, and then, um, then it's an analytic on certain domain uh, around the origin. And it, it's mapped conformally to unit disk. Not unit disk, but disk of radius uc nu. All right, so now those who are familiar with analytic combinatorics understand that in order to study the asymptotics in this kind of case, we would like to extend this uh, disk. So we know that it, uh, the turning function uh, converts inside this disk, but we would like to find some slightly larger region of a Pac-Man shape. So it's called delta domain, so that we can uh, find a contour which goes closely near the critical point, and here would be the main contribution in the asymptotics. So then it would correspond that here we have some slightly larger area where this angle here, what is the angle of this? It depends on the temperature regime. Well, I don't have time to explain how it exactly goes, but uh, there's basically two different angles. Either the angle is like this, uh, which happens uh, when we are on the uh, high temperature, or no, I mean when we are outside the critical temperature, or the angle is like this. 
So here the angle would be something like uh, one over three. All right, but anyway, the idea is that in order to study the singularity structure here, we reduce it to the singularity structure of a much simpler rational function. And that function we know explicitly. So then major part is to show that this uc nu is indeed a unique dominant singularity. So yeah, so yeah, we want to show that UC nu is a unique dominant singularity. And uh, one particular thing to show is that actually this HCS, HCS is the only possible pole of the bivariate rational function G hat, which is mapped to the product of the boundary of those unit, unit disks. Well, this is still simplified, so it depends whether we are in the high temperature, low temperature, or critical. In general, in low temperature, things are easier to show. When we go to high temperature or critical, it becomes harder. All right, and then in the end, we deduce that this Z turning function of variables U and V is holomorphic in the product of such delta domains. Um, which now roughly means that we can use the transfer, tra transfer theorem in analytic combinatorics. Well, this is still oversimplified. So in reality, sometimes we take a product of a slit disk with a delta domain. And sometimes we have two slit disks. So we have something a bit stronger than two delta domains, which is especially needed in the diagonal asymptotic case. But I cannot go too deep in the details. All right, so then what, what, why we want to study all of this? Well, we want to expand the turning function GUV around that critical value and then apply Cauchy integral formula. This is like standard analytic combinatorics, but uh, in a specific setting which doesn't always fall in the standard seam. So now what is remarkable is that um, if we expand this g hat around the critical parameter value, the first derivatives always vanish. Well, this is something which also happens in pure gravity if you try to parameterize things. But then the sec second derivative, partial derivative, vanishes exactly when we are in the critical temperature. And this property, it happens both for z and z hat and u hat. So if you write down those expansions, you will see that where those critical exponents go, come from. So this explains where the critical exponent alpha zero comes from. Well, if you want to study the other critical exponents, well, the alpha one is still easy. It's just you need to go in the coefficients of the turn thing, find a rational parameterization of the coefficient AP the asymptotics, but if you want to study the diagonal thing, you need to go a bit deeper and find a bit different expansion. All right. So I remind now the geometry. I won't talk about combinatorics anymore. So this was our case. We have still a finite boundary of a fixed length, say p plus q. And it, in this example, it's just three plus four and with 18 monochromatic edges and 19 phases. And we want to define a probability distribution. Well, standard way, we define a Boltzmann distribution where um, now we consider this annealed measure of uh, triangulation together with a spin configuration. So we couple uh, a random triangulation together with the easing model, either on vertices or phases. It doesn't matter, distribution has the same form. And then um, here's an example of the last case. So this is what we get in the fixed temperature on the critical line. All right, well, we want to study the limits of this distribution. 
when the boundary tends to infinity. So natural way is to consider the local distance, local limits. So we define the local distance between two easing decorated triangulations T and T prime in the standard way where we just need to take into account that the spins inside these balls of radius R for any fixed R should coincide in order that easing triangulations to coincide inside the ball. And also the boundary conditions restricted to the ball should coincide. But otherwise this is a standard definition of local distance. All right. And uh, well, exactly as in um, pure gravity, the space of easing triangulations together with this local distance is a poly space. And uh, here's our local limit result. So again, we consider fixed temperature and we show that for any fixed temperature there are, we can find two local limits. First is the case where we let only say minus boundary tend to infinity and have still a finite plus boundary in the limit. And then we have another limit where both plus and minus boundary are infinite. And uh, we can bypass this intermediate limit by using the diagonal um, scaling we had before. So we assume that this ratio stays in the compact interval which avoids zero and infinity. And uh, we find the same local limit. And um, we conjecture that this one happens when P and Q tend to infinity at any relative sp speed, but uh, well, we don't have a proof for it, so it's still open. And um, about the basic properties of those local limits, uh, they are one-ended except when um, we consider the last local limit in the low temperature, in which case it's two-ended. And uh, to put it in another way, the local limit um, should have a bottleneck, finite bottleneck, so that we can have a finite subgraph which uh, partitions the local limit in two different parts. And this one, um, why uh, we have this kind of bottleneck? Uh, you can think about um, the, a bit the physics of the easing model. So, in the regular lattice, uh, in the high temp low temperature, um, the model favors sort of like minimal interface length. So spins are really strongly aligned according to this mag magnetic field uh, uh, from the boundary condition. Well, but we are on the random surface, random lattice. So in that case, the minimal interface length also forces a bottleneck on the surface. So that's actually not that surprising. All right. So how to study this local convergence? Well, this is a, we use the standard way to do it via peeling process since we are in a half plane model. So it's particularly nice. We have always a boundary. So we, I recall the same decomposition we use in the combinatorial section. So that's also the first step in the peeling process which we can define on a set of symbols, say, where that C plus and C minus means that we have either plus or minus triangle where the third vertex is in the interior of the unexplored part. Or we have certain cases where it's on the boundary. And well, here we just subtract some cases because we count them twice. But that's just the same combinatorial decomposition. And we can, 
well, it already shows that it defines a probability distribution. So we can really get uh, the limit of these probability distributions uh, by first letting q to tend to infinity and then p tend to infinity, or both same time. All right, so then we have those first peeling steps and we can iterate them to define a peeling process in each of the case. So then we have a sequence of explored and unexplored maps, EN and UN. And uh, say E0 is just the boundary of the triangulation. And then for each unexplored part, we associate a parameter when we are still in the finite parameter case. So now we have a two-dimensional parameter process because we have two boundaries, uh, two boundary segments. And then if those P and Q are finite, we define parameter variations by um, uh, writing the, uh, how much the parameter changes from the initial one. But we notice that this one only depends on the peeling process, so we can define it also for infinite temperature. And here's a picture of it. So first we have exactly one unexplored part. And uh, we explore one triangle, say step n plus 1, which actually divides it to two parts. And then we need some rule to choose which part we continue, which one part we fill immediately and which one we continue to explore. Well, there are several choices. One choice is that we take this as a target. And that's particularly nice when we study the regime where P and Q tend to infinity at the same time. But otherwise we might choose, for example, the one which has more minus edges. And that's natural when we let only, say, Q tend to infinity. All right, but this is more or less standard um, extension of the peeling processes in the percolation setting. UIPT or percolation setting, okay. So, well, if we are now in the totally infinite boundary, so both plus and minus boundaries are infinite, uh, it turns out that this X and Y and process is a random walk uh, on the integers squared, which might also take infinite minus steps. I mean, it might swallow infinite boundary, and that happens only in a low temperature. So it basically means that here we take a peeling step, step which say swallow the whole plus boundary if we define the peeling process. So, well, from this idea, we notice that if we study the sum of those two parameters uh, and condition them to be finite, um, we actually find an order parameter which uh, is zero exactly when we are in the high temperature. And if we are in the critical or low temperature, uh, it's given by an continuous strictly increasing function, which has well-defined limit value in the infinity, and uh, which has also the property in the critical point that actually those two drifts are equal with each other. So what it means in critical temperature, it means that in the critical temperature, it means that when we explore from the boundary um, and we have positive drift of to both parameter processes, it means that the peeling process will only visit this um, boundary of the half plane a finite number of times, so it will eventually drift to infinity. And um, yeah, and in the low temperature, well, yeah, low temperature, when we consider this limit here, it more or less tells that uh, the bottleneck size will tend to zero. 
So this length L tends to zero when, uh, when nu tends to infinity. So in the end, there would be only two uh, triangulations uh, of the half plane, which uh, geometry is like UIP T of the half plane, glued in one vertex. So, and then um, if we are in the high temperature here, we see that actually these two drifts are opposite. So, well, their sum is zero, so they're opposite. So it means that um, in the high temperature, if we combine two peeling processes, say, starting from the minus boundary, it drifts to the left starting from the plus boundary, it drifts to the right. So if we combi combine these two peeling processes, we can find the peeling process which explores the half plane by roughly distance layers. So that one uh, led us to directly construct a local limit. Well, here in the critical temperature, this was in the high temperature, and in critical temperature, we need to construct a local limit by gluing uh, sort of like a ribbon explored by the peeling process with um, two infinite triangulations with the monochromatic boundary. And this is like major technical part in the proof of local limits, local convergence. All right, and actually here, if we are, have a spins on the vertices, there's a difference that um, in that case, we have a total symmetry of the spins in the sense that we have a unique choice in the boundary where we do the peeling like this. And then well, it will take either plus or minus. But the point is that uh, in this case, actually, we have uh, the expectation of x1 and y1 are both zero. But the constructions of the local limits work the same in the, when the spins are on the vertices too. All right, well, we found a nice order parameter, which is something a bit different than physics literature. Well, there's another natural order parameter. So if we just study the probability when the finite boundary is swallowed in a single step, uh, it has this asymptotic. So if you're high temperature, it has the exponent minus phi over two. It is not that surprising. If we are in a plus temperature, well, it has a finite value in the asymptotics because of the bottleneck which And then uh, in the critical temperature, it has the exponent minus one, and this is somehow a crucial exponent when we study the scaling limits of the interface link. All right, but yeah, this, when we take the limit p tends to infinity, defines another order parameter. All right, and then, well, if we are in the critical temperature, this x1 and y1 also belong to a domain of attraction of a totally asymmetric uh, stable law of index 403. And uh, um, we can use an argument uh, used by Nicola in his, one of his works where we have a, these two are not independent, so we study the parameter fluctuations of uh, plus and minus boundary and this rescaled process um, converts to a pair of independent spectrally negative for three stable processes. 
uh, and they, their Levy emissors also, those constants are asymmetric when spins are on the faces because all pe peeling process is asymmetric when we choose to peel from minus boundary. Well, we, if we are on spins on faces, then those two constants would be the same because the peeling process is symmetric with, with respect to the spins. All right. Well, here's a small glimpse of the ge geometry. Well, this is more or less what I draw there. So in the high temperature, when spins are on the faces, it looks like percolated triangulation. And more precisely, it should be like subcritical percolation on the faces. This is a high temperature and low temperature. We have a bottleneck of finite width. Here are the two local limiting critical temperatures. So first on the left, um, we have infinite minus boundary. It's still finite plus boundary, which say might be large. So then we have a large plus cluster adjacent to the boundary. And um, when we let the plus boundary tend to infinity, we, it reveals the ribbon which in the case when spins are in the faces, it's like a um, family of interfaces since there's no unique choice of the interface. So there's certain leftmost interface and rightmost uh, and the other interfaces are in between. Yeah, and actually there's a question raised by Nicola and Gregory. So whether there are some pinch points in this and uh, I guess the answer is yes. So it shouldn't be that hard to prove from the information of the peeling process we have. All right. So here's another picture of the interfaces. Here's the, how the interface looks like when we have a small finite boundary. And the, in this very case, we have sort of like a unique interface. Well, here we have the different kind of interfaces. We also have those finite clusters we don't, I, don't, I haven't touched in my work. So the peeling process always follows uh, infinite interface or large interface, uh, which is um, incident to those um, vertices in the junction points on the boundary. And then when it spins on the vertices, we have indeed a unique interface. All right, so here's last theorem I want to mention. So it's an explicit scaling limit of the infinite interface length. And this works when the spins are on the vertices. Well, we have similar, similar com computation can be done when spins are on the faces, but it doesn't give exactly the length of the interface because of the reason that when the spins are on the faces, we have less control of the interface. But yeah, so when we take P and Q to infinity simultaneously along some tending, along some diagonal or tending to some constant, positive constant, uh, we find an explicit scaling limit where now you see the scaling exponent is exactly one. And um, this limit law, if we choose lambda to be one, we can compute the integral and find like exponent 1, 11 over 3 again, which was the sum of those two parameter exponents before. And then we can also study the interface when we have already an infinite minus boundary and finite plus boundary. We find again, well, this is slightly older result, but find an explicit limit law of the interface length. Well, this limit law exists in the literature and even quite recently. So there's an interpretation in the Liouville quantum gravity. So if we consider two Liouville quantum disks, you don't need to know what it means, but you can just imagine, imagine you have two disks where one of the disks has uh, say length one lambda, one on L and another one has length L plus uh, lambda. 
and then you somehow say conformally weld those two quantum disks together. What is the law of this interface when these points here are somehow typical points from the level boundary measure? Well, this computation here is a simple one if we make the assumption that L is sampled from a two-dimensional Levy measure uh, conditional on this set. And this is somehow natural assumption from the mating of trees theory of little quantum gravity. And then, well, we indeed, with this simple assumption, we find the same law. Well, then actually this law is recently explicitly characterized by a work by Nina Holden and uh, Maurice Ang and uh, Jin Sun, like just say a month ago or so. Okay, and then similarly we can uh, glue this kind of disk with a half plane where we take a segment of length L. So, so-called thick quantum wedge. So we find uh, this one, this limit law. All right. And then there's a, I mentioned already work by Albank, Minar and Schaefer. They study the model of, of the sphere or full plane. Um, and uh, with an infinite volume triangulation or spins on the vertices. And they show the existence of the local limits. And they show also that at the critical temperature, the local limit is almost surely recurrent. All right. There's a future directions and works in progress. I don't have too much time to discuss them, but I'm happy to discuss afterwards with those who are interested. So, well, there are a lot of questions about universality because we touch only triangles. And uh, then we want to understand uh, near critical behavior and we want to understand like different, more general boundary conditions and crossing probabilities scaling limit of finite clusters, probably possibly using some Boltzmann approach or some sort of CLE percolation approach, and then see whether we find something which coincides in the Liouville quantum gravity side. And ultimately, we, we all would like to see the full scaling limit picture of this model and whether it's a nice Liouville quantum gravity surface. All right. I guess that's all. So here's the works I mentioned. These are the, where the talk is based on. And here are um, those which I mentioned or which are related. All right. So, merci beaucoup. Regarde s'il y a des questions. Des questions à la salle. Yes, uh, so I, I want to ask you what, what's happening. Do you know uh, if anything interesting happens in the antiferromagnetic case? Uh, do, do the method break down completely? Or, uh... Well, yeah. I guess I need to do a few computations and mention again. So, well, I did some preliminary computation quickly and I didn't notice in the, at the first glance anything really interesting happening. But um, since we are under triangulations and well, we have two different models and triangulations, I guess it's worth checking again. So, but at this point, I don't have anything to say about it. One, I don't remember if I asked you during your defense, mm -hmm. but uh, what is uh, the status of the quenched easing model on uh, your IPT set? So I, I'm not sure that... Uh, yeah, well, I guess it hasn't been too much study, studied. Well, how I would see that it might not be as like approachable question and also it might not be equally interesting question than Anil because somehow what physics is expecting is that Anil picture should give something different. So the quench is something probably nice to know things but uh, 
I haven't seen anything. Also, the, no. the, the, the case when you allow a small man man magnetic field? Yeah, well, that's a more interesting question, I would say. And <laughs> Thank you, I can go on. <laughs> in principle, there's the work by Bertrand Hénard and Nicolas Orantone, etc., who, um, who might involve small magnetic field on the combinatorial level, but whether it's easy to study the probability side, I'm not sure.